<clears throat> Today we are back in Matthew chapter 14 again, and we're going to pick it back up. We're not done with this scene at Herod's birthday, so we're going <clears> to <throat> pick back up in uh, Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to read verses 11 and 12. Um, before I do, I'll just remind you that Herod commanded John's, John the Baptist's head to be taken. And so it says in verses 11 and 12, And his head was brought in a charger. That means a platter, I believe. His head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. You know, verse 11 reminds me of something that is not even in my notes. It just came to my mind. And that is, uh, look at this, these sick people. The, the, the mother says, get to her daughter to get, the head, get, a, get his head and bring it to me in a platter. And then she does it. And you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of ch uh, people raising their children today uh, in, in, on uh, m murder movies. And, uh, you know, even before they're one year, two years old, uh, they're watching uh, just the most worst abominations that you can have on film. And... Uh, it's sick and it's, it shows us the depravity of human beings. You know, uh, what happens when you're godless? You know, the Bible says that all they that hate me love death. All they that hate me love death. And that's man's problem. He hates God because God is light and God is holy and man is in darkness and he's not holy. And Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it just reminded me of, of, of our absolute depravity apart from the grace of God. Uh, we'd all be just like that. We'd all be just like Herod's family. Mm -hmm. Every person in this room, if not for the grace of God. Uh, so Matthew 14, 11 and 12. His head was brought in a charger given to the damsel. She brought it to her mother and his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Now there where it says his disciples in verse 12, the word disciple means learner. And in that verse, it's referring to the disciples of John the Baptist. Now, <clears throat> even though all believers today are disciples of Jesus Christ, each one of us has people in our lives that we're teaching. Whether they are saved or lost, we're all teaching others by the way we live our lives. We're teaching them through our words and through our actions. And so the question is, what are you teaching? The things that you and I say and do have consequences, even eternal consequences. And that's one of the reasons we should continually pray and strive to be eternally minded. Every single person that we ever interact with is an eternal soul that will either spend eternity in the blessing and glory of God, or they will be punished forever in the lake of fire. And so may God help us to always believe and remember, to believe and remember that as we deal with other people. You don't have to look far in the Bible to see what I'm talking about. When I say that what we uh, say and do has consequences. How about Adam's sin? All the death and destruction and sickness and pain and sorrow and crying and tears, everything. Turn on the news. It's all a result of that man's choice. The first man. One choice. And uh, how about... One other quick example, how about Abraham and Ishmael? I've talked about this before. God told Abraham and his wife, 
that they would have a child from his own loins. It would be his biological child. And for whatever reason, they decided not to wait for God's promise, but they, uh, he went into Ishmael's mother, Hagar, and Ishmael was born. And then, of course, God fulfilled his promise later, and Isaac was born. But he went in, and Ishmael was born. And then Ishmael, his descendants gave us Muhammad, and Muhammad gave us Islam, and Islam gave us death, millions of deaths, and lots of souls in hell forever because Abraham didn't wait for God's promise. So those are two huge examples of how important what we say and do in front of the world out here in this life we live. The consequences can be, there, there are always consequences, good consequences, bad consequences, some temporal, some eternal. We got to be careful. We got to be sober. We got to be serious. We got to be eternally minded. says there uh, his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus I don't want to make a big deal out of this but notice it says they buried John's body you know people ask this question a lot and this is why I'm, I'm bringing it up I'm not going to get into it too much but is cremation okay or should I be buried you know, is burial, cremation, is cremation a sin? Uh, I won't say that cremation is a sin. What I will say is this. The Bible talks about burial. All through from Genesis to Revelation, it talks about burial. Uh, again, I'm not going to say a lot on it. I'll say, I'll say this and then we'll move on. Everyone godly of whom it is mentioned in the Bible was buried. And most importantly, our Lord Jesus Christ was buried. And that is part of the gospel itself. And you'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, <clears throat> by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So the ultimate example that we've ever had and will ever have is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was buried. You do what you think is right. I'll say no more. <clears throat> So after John was beheaded, look at verse 12, Matthew 14, 12. After John was beheaded, <clears throat> it says his disciples went and told Jesus. They went and told Jesus. Hey, that's a good example for you and me to follow. Let's say something happens that just devastates us. What should we do? Tell Jesus. Tell Jesus. Now, I know that sounds like a no-brainer to many, but if we're honest, many times prayer is our last resort. Prayer is our last resort. Many times when something happens, we run around telling everyone else about it. But instead, I got an idea. Pray. Listen to these verses. I'm going to start with ex Exodus 3.7. Thank you. Exodus 3.7. It says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Guess what? God knows what you're going through. And he cares. God cares about you and what you're going through. Look at the verse. Look at the three things. I have seen the affliction. I have heard their cry. I know their sorrows. 
You are not alone. God is with you, dear brother or sister in Christ. And remember, no one knows affliction and sorrow more than our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 7. It says about Jesus, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Jesus understands. He knows. Let's look at two more scriptures so we can see God's care through prayer. Specifically, when we're hurting. I'm going to turn to Psalm 62, verse 8 first. Psalm 62, verse 8. It says, Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. See, sometimes, many times, we can be overwhelmed. We can be overwhelmed with affliction, with crying, with sorrow, with suffering. So it says Selah at the end of that verse. That means think about it. Think about it. Trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Think about it. And then do it. And then Hebrews 4. To see God's care through prayer. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Not only was Jesus sacrificed for us, but he's our great high priest. He ever lives at God's right hand to make intercession for us. And listen to what it says, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched, with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus understands. He was here. He experienced it all without sin. He experienced it all so he can sympathize with our weaknesses. And so it says in Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore, when you see therefore in your Bible, find out what it's there for. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, Jesus, since he understands what we're going through because he experienced it himself without sin, therefore, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And as I always tell the Lord, we're always in a time of need. Always. We need him desperately all the time, whether we realize it or not. So, let us come boldly unto his throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Matthew 14, 13. Matthew 14, 13 says, When Jesus heard, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. <clears throat> And so even though our Lord is omniscient, he knows all, and 
He knows all things from eternity. He was still moved by the death of John and went to spend time alone with the Father in prayer. So, one thing this verse teaches us is the importance of getting away from other people to be alone with our Heavenly Father. By the way, we need to do that regularly, whether there's something wrong or not, whether something bad happens or not. We need to regularly get alone with our Heavenly Father. Now, we don't have deserts in New Jersey like the Lord had in Israel, but we do have rooms with doors and locks on them. Uh, we do have the woods. We do have uh, fields. Take your Bible and go in a room, close the door, take a walk by yourself and pray or drive somewhere. Do whatever you have to do. Just make it happen. Get alone with God. He's waiting. He's waiting for you. Don't keep him waiting. Also notice in verse 13 that the people followed Jesus. Verse 13, they followed him. They followed him. Now we spoke that about that. I mentioned that earlier, that you and I should live in such a way that others can follow us as we follow Christ. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, the Greek word in that verse that's translated follow is the Greek word mimetes or mimetes. Okay, sounds like mimic because that's where the English word mimic comes from. And it means to imitate, imitate. So be ye imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. So I got a great question for everybody in this room. Ready? Listen now. What would the church be like if we all imitated you? If we all imitated you, what would we all be like if everybody in this room imitated you? What would the church be like? What kind of place would that be if everybody imitated me or you? Good question. Searching question. Think about that one. If you're, you hear my voice, what would the church be like if everybody was just like you? May God help us to pray and strive to have a good witness and to be a good example so that those in our house and outside of it can follow us as we follow Christ. Matthew 14, 14. <clears throat> Jesus went forth. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. Notice verse 14. Jesus was moved with compassion. When you and I see a crowd of people, we think, ugh, right? I don't know about you, but honestly, I don't like big crowds. That's my first reaction. But I thank God that he's not like me. And I beg God to make me more like him. And I suggest you do the same. God looks down on us and sees and hears every wicked abomination that is thought and said and done everywhere on this earth at all times. And yet he has compassion toward us. By the way, not just that God knew about every sin there would ever be, including all your sins. <clears throat> he knew about every detail of it from all eternity. And yet still he has compassion. Wow, what a God, what a wonderful, merciful, patient, long-suffering, and gracious God he is. He is absolutely and utterly incredible, and there is none like him. Blessed be his holy name forever and ever. 
And so all those things I just said about our wonderful God explain why we see Jesus moved with compassion because he is the one I'm describing. He is God, God in the flesh. That's one of the reasons Jesus came to this earth to reveal God to man, to show us what God really is like, who God really is. How about John chapter one? We've got three verses in John chapter one, verses one, 14 and 18. John 1, 1, verse 14 and 18 as well. In the beginning was the word, that's Jesus. And the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as the as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So if you want to know who God is and what he's like, then read and study the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of course the whole Bible, but specifically Jesus the word was made flesh and no man has seen God at any time. And so the only time God has ever been, been seen, because there's no contradiction in the Bible. God, the Bible says God has been seen throughout the Bible, but only one person of the Godhead of the Trinity can be seen. That's the second person, the word, the eternal son of God. And so all throughout the Bible, when it talks about, and they saw God or the angel of the Lord, that phrase, the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate, it's what we call a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. So no man has ever seen God the Father. And then, of course, God the Holy Spirit is a spirit. Uh, the only visible person of the Godhead is Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. And so if you want to see God, look at him in the word. And then how about Colossians 1? Before we continue, Colossians 1, verses 14 through 19. Still on this thought that Jesus is God. In whom, Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now here's what it says about Jesus who shed his blood. He's the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature. Now, just in case you're confused, the firstborn doesn't mean Jesus was born back there thousands of years ago. He didn't have a beginning, and we're going to see that in the next verse, and we've already seen it in John. Okay, Firstborn is not speaking of his chronology. It's speaking of his preeminence. Firstborn is a term you'll find all throughout the Bible that does not always mean firstborn. It has to be determined by the context, like every other word. Okay. Uh, in the Old Testament, I hope I don't get the names uh, confused, but God says, Ephraim is my firstborn. Eh. No, he was not born first. Manasseh was. But God is saying, Ephraim is my firstborn in the sense of preeminence, not chronology. Okay, and you'll find that throughout the Bible. So he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn. That means he's the chief. He's the top. He's over everyone else. That's what it means. Not that he had a beginning. And we see that in the next verse, of course. So he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. Well, my Bible says in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now it says in Colossians 1, by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created because Jesus is God. Matter of fact, that's an interesting word in Genesis 1, 1. It's Elohim. Now in the Hebrew, and you know, I'm no Hebrew scholar, but when, they, when, when you have I am on the end, that's plural. So although there's only one God, it could be read in English, directly translated. In the beginning, God's, capital G, created the heaven and the earth. There's only one God, but that word Elohim suggests a plurality. Uh, 
one God, again, I'm not a Hebrew expert, but I've had this broken down before by people who are, and Elohim is literally means that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit did it all. And you'll find all three of them actually there, not just in that word. But for by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. See, he's the firstborn. He's the top. He's the chief. He's the creator. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him, all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now, see there, it is used chronologically. See, how do I know? Because Jesus is the first one to be resurrected in history, never to die again. That's what it means. So that time, it is chronological. He's the first for this to happen to. Has to always be determined by the context. Firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. A.K.A. Jesus is God. Now, if you've been listening to me for a while, you might wonder, why does he always talk about this? Why does he keep pointing out that Jesus is God? Why? Well, one of the reasons is because of what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 24. John 8, 24, listen to what Jesus said. He said, <clears throat> Ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. And see, I skipped over a word there. In my King James Bible in English, there's the word he. I am he. But if you notice, the word he is in italics. And that's the translators letting us know that they added that word to help us understand. Now, in many cases in the Bible, when they add those italicized words, it's helpful. But unfortunately, sometimes it changes the meaning of the verse. And so a recommendation I have for you is that as you read through the Bible, try to read the verse by ignoring the italicized words. And if the verse makes sense without it, leave it, leave it. If it helps to understand the verse, then use it. That's what it's there for. In, in some cases, it's, it actually is harmful. In this case, that's one of those cases. Ye shall, he says, ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am. And of course, if you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. Because in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses came before the burning bush and said, what, who is your, what is your name? And God said, I am that I am. Okay? And that means he is the eternal, self-existent creator. He is Jehovah. But he said to Moses, I am. Tell them, I am hath sent me unto you. And then uh, 1,500 years later, the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe, don't quote me on that. 1,500 years later, Jesus takes upon flesh and says, I am. That's why they want, one of the reasons they wanted to kill him, because he was claiming to be, they all understood what many people don't understand today. Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is God. And so why do I labor this point? Well, one of the reasons is if you don't believe in Jesus, that he's God, you're not saved. If you don't believe that Jesus is God, you're not a Christian. If you don't believe that Jesus is God, you're not going to heaven. If you don't believe that Jesus is God, he said, you'll die in your sins. And that means you go to hell. And that means you're going to experience everlasting punishment in the lake of fire. And I don't want you to go there. I don't want anyone to go there. That's why I always teach people. That's why I've tried to teach people who God is. Listen to what Jesus says in John 17, 3. You know this verse. For this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. 
And so if you study John 17, 3, you will realize that the very essence of eternal life and what it means to have eternal life is to know God. So if you don't know God, you don't have eternal life. That's what Jesus said. And not just knowing who he is, I can tell you that while I'm blue, till I'm blue in the face, but knowing him. See, in John chapter 10, he said, I know my sheep and have known and am known of mine. But in Matthew 7, to all those that professed him as Lord their whole lives, he says, I never knew you. See, not that you were saved until you blew it. He says, I know my sheep, but then to them, I never knew you. So knowing the Lord, and of course, yes, that includes knowing who he is as revealed in the word of God. Knowing him is what it means to have eternal life. Do you know him? If you know him, praise him. If you don't know him, seek him. Now, back to the topic of compassion. We left off in Matthew 14 about compassion. Since God is compassionate, his children are too. We should be. And that compassion, listen, that compassion towards others should cause us to do things. Things that aren't so easy sometimes. Things that aren't so comfortable, such as preaching the gospel. When I got saved in 2005 at Mission Teens, they drilled something into my head very early on that I remember to this day. They said to me, God wants to get you out of your comfort zone. And guess what? They were right. He does. And that takes faith. That takes faith. And so I ask, do you really believe people are going to hell? Do you really believe that you're not? Do you really believe that the only way your family, friends, neighbors, relatives, co-workers, you really believe that the only way they can be saved is by hearing the word of God and the gospel? Do you really believe that? If your answer is yes, then let me ask you this. Have your words and deeds, since you got saved, demonstrated that you believe those things? Or is everything I just said something that you nod your head to every week and say, yes, I, amen, I believe that. Why am I talking like this? Because time's running out. Time's running out, brethren. Soon, it'll be too late to sow the seed. Soon, it'll be too late for the lost to get saved. So, may God fill us with compassion. May he fill us with compassion that leads to action. How about John 9, 4? John 9, 4. <clears throat> Listen to what Jesus said. It's true for him and it's true for us. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Matthew 9, Matthew 9, 36 through 38. Matthew 9, 36 through 38. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as having no shepherd. Sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, listen up, disciples. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Have you prayed for God to send laborers into his harvest? Have you ever prayed that prayer for God to send laborers into his harvest? Well, let me remind you of something if you have. That's the, what I just read to you were the last verses of chapter 9 
of Matthew. They, he said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. And I'm sure the disciples did that immediately after, probably in their next prayer. They prayed that prayer. Lord, send laborers into the harvest. Well, guess what? The first verse of chapter 10, Jesus sends them. So have you been praying for God to send laborers into the harvest? Well, when they did, he sent them right after. So he's sending you. That's why you're here. That's why God leaves us here after we get saved, to be his witnesses. So keep that in mind. If, you pray, if you've prayed to the Lord to send laborers into his harvest, then labor. That's something that's on my prayer list every day for, to, for God to send laborers into his harvest. And I, and I add to that, Lord, send laborers Send us, help us to labor, help us to labor in prayer, help us to labor in the word, help us to labor in the body of Christ, help us to labor in evangelism, help us to labor by the power and help us to labor by the leading and power of the Holy Spirit, help us to labor according to the word of God, help us to labor because the night cometh when no man can work and it's going to be too late. May God help us to labor.